Good afternoon, and welcome to our session on farmed animal advocacy. Where are we and what's next? Our speaker for this session is Zoe Sigel. She is the Global Corporate Engagement Manager at Mercy for Animals. In her corporate work, Zoe partners with global food companies to develop and implement strong animal welfare procurement policies, which altogether are expected to directly improve the lives of tens of millions of farmed animals every year. She has mentored, trained, and collaborated with dozens of organizations around the world in corporate outreach techniques and strategy. So please join me with a warm welcome for Zoe Sigel. Thanks, Nathan. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. How are you all? Good? Awesome. I'm glad to hear. Um, I first off want to thank the Center for Effective Altruism for putting on this incredible event. I have just been so inspired by the curiosity and the passion that folks are bringing to this event. And I am so excited to now get to talk about one of my passions, and that is doing the most good that we can for farmed animals. So every year, there are around 80 billion land animals that are killed for food. And each one of these individual animals is capable of feeling fear, joy, suffering, and excitement. However, in a food system that has been built to exploit these animals for the lowest price, these animals are unfortunately suffering through some of the most horrific and vast and, and chronic suffering day in and day out. And as mere commodities, these sentient farmed animals around the world are, again, living and dying through these unimaginable conditions and abuses, often without any meaningful legal protections. So despite their sentience, despite their numbers and their deep suffering, these farmed animals face a tremendous discrepancy in the amount of funding and attention that they receive. When we look at just the amount of funding for animals, Farmed animals receive only about 1% of those donor funds, despite the fact that farmed animals are over 99% of the animals that are killed by humans. So I work for Mercy for Animals, and Mercy for Animals has a mission to end industrial animal agriculture by constructing a sustainable and just food system. We operate in Mexico, India, China, uh, the United States, Brazil, Canada, and around the globe through our global programs. We have three approaches that we take to our work. Uh, first, we want to make alternatives to animal proteins as accessible and as attractive as possible. Second, we want to make animal products themselves less competitive and less attractive. And third, for the farmed animals that are still stuck and trapped in this food system, we want to reduce their suffering as much as we can. So today, in discussing high impact for farmed animals, I'm going to touch on corporate policy, uh, corporate accountability. I will then discuss other, ecosystem, or other interventions that are part of this wider ecosystem of tactics that we can implement for farmed animals. And at the end, we are going to have time for Q&A. So open up your swap cards throughout this presentation and jot down any questions that you have in there. So first, I'm going to talk about corporate policy. The animal protection movement has catalyzed real shifts for animals through corporate policy. And many organizations, including, I know there are folks in this room that are part of these organizations around the world, are moving forward the ball for animals in corporate policy work, not only for you know, chickens that are raised for meat, but for fish, getting pigs out of gestation crates. And today, in order to give focus to this presentation, I am going to discuss the issue of laying hen confinement. So in the world today, an estimated 84% of hens globally live in battery cages. And these battery cages are small cages where about three to 10 hens live virtually their entire lives. Uh, three to 10 hens per cage. And each hen has about the size of a notebook sized piece of paper to live her entire life. In these cages, animals are unable to exhibit many of their natural behaviors like nesting, uh, foraging, dust bathing, spreading their wings. So the Welfare Footprint Project has created some methodology to 
estimate the amount of pain that animals go through. And there's a lot of information on the slide, but I want you to see and really focus on two statistics here. The first is that each hen living in a battery cage is expected to live through 11,000 hours of pain throughout her shortened life. Hens in cage-free aviaries are expected to live about a little less than 4,000 hours of pain through her shortened life. There's two things I want you to take away from this. First, even hens that are in cage-free systems are still suffering. 4,000 hours of pain is significant. It is no joke. However, while hens, while 84% of hens on Earth are still trapped in cages, we need to do what we can to reduce their suffering. And one way to do that is to move systems away from cages into cage-free systems. Because this is going to reduce the pain that a hen experiences by 300 hours of, or sorry, 300 days of pain throughout her life. And one way that the animal movement has made progress on this is by securing corporate cage-free commitments. And this can be effective through both corporate outreach and campaigns. Corporate outreach looks like educating and negotiating with executives to improve the treatment of animals in their supply chain. Campaigns look like uh, organizations launching, launching public awareness campaigns that say, hey, this company is doing this really bad thing for animals, and with that public pressure, with that public exposure, companies are likely to do something about that and improve their policies for animals. So since, corp since organizations have worked on these corporate policies since about the mid-2000s in Europe, there have been over 2,000 policies around the world uh, that have adopted cage-free ag commitments covering their national or regional supply chains. And this has had real impact. In 2015, the, in the United States, corporate commitments really started rolling in. And with those commitments, what you can see here is uh, increasing from about 2015 to now in 2022, the cage-free egg flock in the United States has grown to be 35% of the US laying hen flock. And this is due to corporate commitments as well as state legislative bans that were really enabled by the corporate commitments. And this is also effective in other parts of the world. Uh, this is an example of some campaigning in Brazil, specifically. Uh, there was a campaign that went on for years against a major retailer called GPA, and it was a coalition effort with organizations like Mercy for Animals, Forum Animal, and Animal Equality, and others. And after three years of campaigning, they were able to secure a massive corporate cage-free commitment from GPA and many meet and many other retailers in the same time frame, as well as after, have also made important cage-free commitments in Brazil. However, each region can face various contexts, various legal, social, political contexts. And with this in mind, we need to make sure our approach is, is appropriate in those regions. And, and sometimes what we find is that a global approach is going to be more effective. So what you see on this slide is the Open Wing Alliance and their over 70 member organizations around the world. This is a coalition of organizations that are all working to end the caging of hens. And they're able to unify their voice to demand that companies address these, th this confinement of laying hens on a global scale. And with the work of the Open Wing Alliance, its member organizations, and other animal protection organizations around the world, over 130 global companies have adopted cage-free egg commitments covering their entire global supply chains. And this is really important because in parts of the world where cage-free commitments are not yet the norm, these global commitments can be an important foothold to get that progress going. However, there are still over four billion hens on Earth that are still in cages right now. And so with that in mind, there still needs to be a lot more progress. There's a lot more than 130 global food companies. And one thing that Mercy for Animals has identified that we can do is by looking at the companies that are based in the global north that have cage-free commitments covering the US and Europe, but haven't extended those cage-free commitments to the rest of the world, to the global south. 
So with that in mind, last year, Mercy for Animals launched the International Cage-Free Equity Index in partnership with seven other organizations around the world. And in doing that, we, rec we have really advanced the messaging that animal welfare concerns and food safety concerns do not end at the borders of global north countries. There are groups, including these and, and many others around the world, that are advocating to end the use of cages in their countries, not only because they as advocates care, but because their communities care as well. And so I want to share some reasoning behind reports like the International Cage Free Equity Index. This is an index that ranks companies against each other. And I like to call these benchmarking reports. Benchmarking reports are really helpful for the animal protection movement for several reasons. One, they give companies a very clear deadline. Uh, when companies have a deadline to meet, they have a lot more urgency and they tend to prioritize issues more effectively. Two, benchmarking reports actually rank companies against each other. And we have heard from companies that benchmarking reports are literally part of their KPIs. They want and are motivated to perform well on those. And then third, benchmarking reports provide a very straightforward path for engagement uh, when it comes not only to corporate outreach, but to corporate campaigns. Once these reports are launched, we're able to uh, use these to recognize some of the best performers, but also recognize the poor performers. And this, is, this really depends on what the organization um, wants to do in terms of who they want to highlight. So we were glad to see that with the first iteration of this report last year, uh, it led to five new global cage-free ad commitments in partnership with other campaigns and other global um, uh, corporate outreach. But getting commitments is not enough. Uh, they're not effective unless they are actually implemented. And this is an emerging theme amongst the animal protection movement of how do we hold companies accountable? When we aren't engaging companies, there's truly a risk of regression. I want to give an example of what happened in Canada last year in 2021. In 2021, the Retail Council of Canada uh, redacted a cage-free and crate-free ad commitment that they had made. And in the weeks following, several retailers across Canada started taking down their cage-free and crate-free commitments. So Mercy for Animals sprang to action on this issue and we directed a coalition response, engaged with these corporations, and within a few weeks, we were able to get major Canadian retail grocery chains like um, Sobeys and Loblaws to repost their policies. In addition to that, we were able to get new policies from major uh, retailers like Metro. And then after that, uh, knowing that it was so important to hold companies accountable in Canada, we launched the Can Canada Scorecard and with this Canada scorecard, this again ranked companies throughout Canada on how they're performing on animal welfare, we were able to get 26 new policy actions out of that. Um, and by that, I mean companies either reporting progress for the first time, or in some cases, even new policies altogether. So the first step that groups can take when it comes to accountability is asking companies to report their progress. This is in line with a lot of other ESG disclosures that companies are reporting on. Um, for example, ones related to carbon emissions or deforestation. This is in line with those. Second, we can look to benchmarking reports. Many of you may be familiar with Compassion and World Farming's Egg Track Report. They have put that out for several years and it looks at the progress that is ma being made on the cage-free issue in uh, US, Europe, as well as globally. However, we saw that there wasn't a lot of reporting and also not a lot of necessarily progress in other parts of the world like Latin America and Asia and more. So last year, Mercy for Animals launched the first ever Monitor de Iniciativas Corporativas por los Animales. That is a Latin American cage-free egg tracker. And as a result of this project, we got major companies to report their Latin American cage-free egg progress for the first time, like GPA, which is a major Brazilian retailer, and JBS, which is the world's largest meat company. And this year, in the second round of this benchmarking report, we saw that the companies in the first iteration had a 20% of them moved up a rank in the second report, which means that companies are actually making progress, but it also pressures the other 80% of companies to say, hey, your peers are making progress, you need to as well. 
I also want to shout out Synergia Animal. They have recently released within the last month an incredible tracker in Asia to track cage-free egg progress in the Asia region, um, which is very exciting to see uh, more accountability there. And then, of course, as projects change, or sorry, as priorities change, projects can change as well. And so this year, the International Cage Free Equity Index coming out in a couple months is featuring, or is, is being collaborated on by 14 organizations, and it's not only going to look at our companies equitable in their commitments, but are they equitable in their reporting? Are they only reporting progress in the global north, only in the US and Europe, or are they including reporting for all parts of the world? And a third way to hold companies accountable is to have public awareness campaigns. Uh, this was a campaign that was done by our team in Brazil. They went ahead and sent flashlights out to companies and said, hey, you're leaving the public in the dark about animal welfare. Please shine a light on the progress in your supply chain. Uh, they put out billboards and did a lot of other public tactics. And as a result of this campaign, they were able to get major uh, Brazil companies to report for the first time ever in Brazil, like Starbucks, as well as International Meal Company, which is a major restaurant operator throughout Brazil. So what I want to emphasize here is that as we move forward, and especially as we move closer to 2025, which is a major deadline for cage-free ad commitments, it is paramount that we hold companies accountable to those commitments. And so the methods that I shared so far, corporate outreach, benchmarking reports, public campaigns, are important and successful, but we need to remain vigilant. We need to remain vigilant going into 2025 and beyond, and especially so in parts of the world where there really needs to be more acceleration of the um, cage-free transition. Now, corporate engagement work has been a highly impactful intervention in this space, but I also want to talk about other interventions, because oftentimes in advocacy, it's really a combination of interventions that play complementary roles, that each mutually reinforce each other to create more social change and makes more social change more tractable. So in general, we believe that we are more likely to create institutional change in places where we're able to really harness people power. Uh, where we're able to have a more sympathetic public and we're able to have a stronger advocacy community. So when we analyze what countries that might include, we really look at two factors. We look at high global influence and high tractability. And we quantify this, and there's a ton of information on this if you want to look more into it, in Mercy for Animals Farm Animal Opportunity Index. You can find that information at data.mercyforanimals.org if you want to dig into it, uh, but there's just a ton of information about the opportunities around the world in that index. So in regions that there are, where we expect there to be high potential tractability, we might be able to start with institutional change, like corporate policy. However, in other regions, farmed animals may be less on the public radar, there might be less established movement building. And with this in mind, the first, thing that to, the first thing that might be best to do is actually public awareness building, rallying the base. And the reason being that when we're able to create that power and build that people power, it's gonna make decision makers take us more seriously. Now, impact for animals is, it's, it's our ultimate goal, right? We, that's what we wanna do. And we think that changing the institutions that cause such immense suffering to animals is how we're going to get there. We think that that is what makes it, that is going to make it easier for people in those systems to make the choices that spare animals from suffering. And underpinning that are the tactics and the infrastructure that really create the power so we can make that social change more tractable. And this includes things like people power, public awareness and public support, gathering evidence through investigations, building the infrastructure that we need, and funding. And when we aren't getting traction with a company or a legislator through negotiation, we can turn to companies or rankings, or uh, sorry, we can turn to campaigns or rankings to hold them publicly accountable. But if that doesn't work, we can look to things like investigations and public campaigns that attract public support 
and rally people so we can build power to make progress, even if not for the current campaign, so we can build power so the next campaign has an even bigger win. And putting on a campaigner's hat, I think this is a question that we can ask ourselves as a movement more often. Not just did we win this time, but did we build the power this time to win bigger next time? And I'll repeat that because I think it's so important. Did we build the power this time to win bigger next time? And even in regions with stronger movements where there has been a lot of success and we're tackling bigger issues, there's still a need to continue building people power. We saw this over the last few years in the US. Uh, the US movement has been trying to reignite progress for accelerating and, and really just getting companies to address some of the most egregious abuses that happen to chickens that are raised for meat. There was a lot of progress made between about 2016 and 2018, but in 2019 and 2020, we saw progress really starting to decline. And so after three years of no major undercover investigations, no major media coverage, we finally achieved major coverage in the New York Times about the treatment of, cost of chickens in Costco's supply chain. And leveraging the really wide coverage of this investigation from, from newspapers like the New York Times and beyond, we launched a tenacious public campaign that lasted eight months and it brought Costco to the negotiating table. And with this, we were able to get Costco to uh, improve the on-farm conditions for chickens at their Lincoln Poultry, Lincoln Premium Poultry Plant, which is gonna improve the lives of over 100 million chickens every single year. And one year after that, we had a major opinion documentary collaboration with the New York Times, which reviewed conditions with a producer, Pilgrims, that produces about 20% of the chicken in the United States. And utilizing the two pieces, the piece from Costco, the piece from, about Pilgrims, and the New York Times, as well as another benchmarking report called the US Broiler Retailer Report, we were able to work with major retailers and start accelerating and getting progress again on this issue uh, and getting major retail grocery chains to make substantial commitments for the chickens in their supply chain. And this included major retailers like Sprouts, Giant Eagle, Natural Grocers, Albertsons, Kroger, Meyer, and more. So we've looked at various interventions in this space. Uh, corporate interventions and then also how building people power and, and these other interventions can really support these institutional changes that we need for animals. But I want to finish by zooming in on a personal perspective here. When I joined the animal rights movement, I focused on farmed animals motivated by EA principles. I wanted to do everything in my power to address some of the most industrialized, institutionalized, widespread forms of inhumanity that is often hidden from the public eye. But that's enough about me. I wanna talk about you and what you can do because this issue has so much room for potential impact. The scale is significant, the cause is relatively neglected, and the interventions in this space are fairly tractable. So there's many ways to contribute, and I wanna highlight three. Um, the first is you can give. There are effective farmed animal advocacy organizations in this room right now that you can give to. Uh, secondly, you can volunteer. You can lend the skills that you have to improve the lives of farmed animals through the farmed animal advocacy methods that these organizations take. And you can also help build the people power that we need to create impact. And number three, the third way you can get involved is by pursuing a career in animal advocacy. Uh, if you're interested in that, I know there's a talk tomorrow uh, that Lauren is doing about animal advocacy careers that I recommend folks go to, but you can also go to their job board. Um, it's animaladvocacycareers.com slash, sorry, animaladvocacycareers.org slash job board. So as a couple quick notes, I'm gonna have open office hours after this in the foyer, so I'm happy to talk with folks who are interested, but we're gonna go ahead and go into Q&A now. And for Q&A, I will preface it by saying I have expertise in corporate engagement work and global scale farm animal welfare work. And I know that in this room, I was looking at the attendee list ahead of time, there are some incredible experts in farmed animal advocacy in this room right now. 
So for the Q&A, um, I will give a shot at a lot of the answers, but I'm also going to open it up and invite folks in the audience to answer questions if you feel you have a very relevant answer that you want shared. So if that, if that time comes up, I'll ask folks to raise their hand, and when they do so, um, I will, if, if I call on you, someone will run over with a microphone, and once, that, once you have the microphone, you can go ahead and speak, but don't speak before that, otherwise it's not gonna be on the YouTube recording. So we can go ahead and get started with our Q&A. <laughs> All right, thank you. So I've got the Swap Card app up and can continue to monitor for questions as they come in. We've got some good ones um, already that I'll start to work through. Um, kind of just going back to the beginning of the talk, I think in issues like this where pretty much everybody can agree that the status quo is not good or very bad or totally intolerable, sometimes I notice that people don't like to put forward a vision of the future. Ending industrial agriculture was kind of, you know, what you said was the mission statement. Do you have a vision of kind of what is next, or do you kind of strategically hold back a vision of what is next in order to focus on the current status quo and the problems with yeah, that? Yeah, that's a good question. So specifically, the mission is actually to end industrial agriculture by constructing a sustainable and just food system. So we really are invested and interested in learning about and, and investigating and, and working on the solutions that we need for that. So. I think one example of a world that does not have, where we're really ending industrial animal agriculture is really well highlighted by a program at Mercy for Animals called Transformation. It's a program that works to collaborate with farmers and create viable solutions for what it looks like to transition from animal agriculture to plant farming. Um, and this is a very exciting program that um, I invite folks to look more into, but I think that's definitely one part of the future that we're looking for and the vision that we're looking for. Another question going back toward the beginning, and maybe we could even put flip the slides back. Do oh. we have the clicker? Here, let me get it. Got the clicker. Oh, you beat me to it. Um, you just had the, the chart about the relative hours of suffering in the different conditions. And uh, another hero of the space, Bruce uh, Friedrich, just asked for a little bit more information on that because he was sort of saying the difference in hours just seems like a surprisingly large difference from. 4,000 to more than 11,000. Yeah, so I mean, if you look at the slide, what you'll see is that a lot of that, the, I mean, you can see on the right-hand side the, the differences and the different uh, ailments that the animals go through. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the behaviors and the natural behaviors that they're unable to exhibit in cage systems. They're unable to nest, they're unable to even spread their wings, and this is something that causes a significant amount of um, deprivation and, and psychological issues as well as just levels of pain ranging from annoying to hurtful, disabling, and more. So these big, as I look at this more closely, these blue bars at each level, movement restriction, foraging deprivation, and nest deprivation, that's where that's where, that's where the bars are collapsing. That's where a significant amount is, yeah. And you'll see even for the uh, hens in the cage-free aviaries, one big issue is keel bone fractures, and that is um, something that I know other groups are working on. I know Healthier Hens is an organization that is working on feed supplementation to affect keel bone fractures, sorry, keel bone fractures in hens. It's interesting, too, studying this a little bit more, you do see that some of the bars, or the colors, not the total, obviously, but some of them do even get a little bit bigger in the cage-free scenario, which to me is reassuring in the sense that it, this analysis seems more honest in uh, virtue of that and uh, obviously acknowledges some genuine trade-offs, but yeah. obviously the totals are still dramatically different. Yeah. So a question on just kind of the economics of this, all of these different interventions that one might pursue, how does that ultimately cash out into price differences mm -hmm. and what have you seen about consumer willingness to pay for a cage-free label or other kind of designations? Yeah, that's a good question. There's a ton of surveys that have been done to look at consumer willingness to pay. Um, sorry, the first part of your question was about the, the price difference. Yeah, cost difference and yeah. how that compares to willingness to pay. Yeah, of course. So one thing that we have seen over time is um, in the United States, for example, if you go back to when the egg-laying flock, the cage-free egg-laying flock was only 6% of hens, 
uh, there was going to be a, a vast difference in the price of cage-free versus cage eggs back then. And just as we go along with supply and demand, as the supply rises of cage-free eggs, the, the price will go down. Um, so that we do expect that gap to, to um, you know, be closer to, to, we expect like closer to price parity as we uh, move forward in the, in the transition. Um, one thing that's worth noting though is major corporations, ones that you might not even expect, are actually making progress on this issue. Um, McDonald's is, I forget the sp specific statistic, I want to say they might be like over 60 or 70 percent cage-free now in the United States. So it's not um, impossible for companies to do. They are finding ways to incorporate that into their structures. Um, the second part of your question was? Willingness to pay. Willingness to pay, yeah. So there's been a lot of surveys around the world on this. Um, I, in one that comes to mind recently in Taiwan, uh, there was a survey that was conducted that said 95% of respondents were actually willing to pay up to 5% more for um, what they considered higher animal welfare eggs. So it, it varies by country, but we do see that um, depending on the country, there's gonna be that increased willingness to pay. But it's also an opportunity for corporations to, to absorb that cost in other ways. Um, one example, is they could reduce the amount of eggs that they're purchasing altogether and replace that with some plant-based alternatives, and that is a way to uh, help drive down those costs of, of eggs overall so they're able to accommodate the, the, the increased price of cage-free eggs during the transition. So ultimately, that 5%, I think the pr current price difference, if I go you know, to the safe way around the, the way here, is bigger than that, right? It's more than a 5% difference today, but you think with time and with just kind of working through of the adoption of new methods, that gap can shrink down to even below a 5% price um, delta? I personally haven't done the economic analysis on that. Uh, I don't know if anyone in this room has either. I'll just Could do a, a first quick chance scan. For the mic runner. Yeah, I, yeah no so I don't have the specific answer to that off the top of my head. Okay, yeah. well that's totally fair. Um, so obviously you work with corporations. Do you feel that like why corporations? Are corporations ahead of the public or ahead of politicians or more susceptible to pressure campaigns or just more accessible in some way than other kind of places where you might try to intervene in the system? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think, you know, when we look at institutional change, uh, you know, two big areas we could look to are governmental changes or corporate changes. And the truth of the matter is corporations have a lot less bureaucracy than a lot of government change can have. And so, you know, there's one element there where it's, it's much simpler for corporations to make a decision to change the policies um, for their supply chain. But the second component of that is, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking here. The, sorry, can you repeat the question really quick? Um, <laughs> it was sure. on the tip of my yeah, tongue. Yeah, I, I was starting to think about the next question. Yeah. Um, what did I just say? <laughs> Well, why corporations? Yeah, that was the big yeah, idea. Yeah, why corporations? So as opposed okay. to yeah. you know targeting yeah. politicians or yeah, other exactly. leverage points. Yeah, so the bureaucracy, and then also pressure campaigns. Um, corporations have brand images to protect, and uh, if if there's an undercover investigation done on one of their suppliers, and the news gets out that they are supporting some of the worst um, abuses that exist in factory farming, that is really bad for their brand. So um, there's also that opportunity to to impact them in that way. What are your interactions with corporate folks like? I guess, first of all, you mentioned that you know, all, all big global corporations have some sort of sustainability or you know, social responsibility department, which presumably then is the, the natural place for you to go. How big, uh, and presumably you're you know, focused on companies that are focused on food, so how big of a slice of their overall portfolio is animal issues before you show up? That's a good question. So a lot of companies will do analyses of how their own management feels about various CSR issues as well as how stakeholders and shareholders feel about animal welfare issues. And oftentimes we unfortunately see that animal welfare lies on a little bit of the lower side of both where management cares and where shareholders and stakeholders care. 
Um, and that's an opportunity for us. We, we are stakeholders. We um, are people that care about what's happening in their supply chain. And so that's an opportunity for us to kind of raise the bar in that area and also just educate corporate executives. Sometimes they literally have no idea that animals are confined in cages um, and that, you know, that hens are confined in cages. So this is an op education opportunity. And we find that when they learn about the issues and, and learn about the material risks, whether those are regulatory risks, market risks, um, reputational risks, it's something that they, they, a lot of them will take seriously. Yeah, that's fascinating to think that executives at food companies would literally be unaware of uh, this issue is pretty surprising. So maybe just tell us a little bit more about, and I think you could also, I know there's another session tomorrow on careers in this space, but I'm interested in kind of how you got into the space and kind of what backgrounds and you know, preparation you think would put people in a, a good position to do the kind of work that you're doing. But maybe first, like, give us a little bit more on kind of the range of interactions that you have with these corporate team members. You mentioned kind of, you know, sometimes they're just ignorant and kind of open to education. I would imagine that there's a pretty wide range of, of interaction modes, though. Some people must be hostile. Some people must be just kind of dismissive. Uh, maybe that's wrong, but tell me what, you know, get, kind of characterize the, the range of interaction types that you have. There are people that are entirely non-responsive, and, um, but not necessarily always. Like sometimes it just takes a lot of follow-up to get there. Uh, and then there are also companies that really care, and when they hear from us, they want to like hit the ground running and do something, and um, you know, will invite me out for an in-person corporate meeting so we can really address the issue head on and, and pretty quickly move, you know, within weeks to put out a major um, commitment for animals. So there's, there's a wide range, and I think even with companies that are um, not responsive to the issue at first, those are ones that really need the education because they don't know uh, the urgency of it, the fact that there are literally, you know, 4.8 billion hens on earth right now that need consideration and many of them are in their supply chain. And so, yeah, there's a wide range, I would say, of the responses from companies. So how do you balance the, you know, you presumably you kind of approach with an educational tone at first. Um, at some point there's also the prospect or the kind of implied threat of a pressure campaign which presumably they don't want and you know that's I would imagine when interactions turn a little bit more tense. How do you balance the fact that you're kind of on both sides of that? Like you want to be friendly and constructive together but ultimately you're not going to take no for an answer and just you know let them keep doing what they're doing. So how do you personally balance that as you're interacting with these decision makers? Yeah, so I think we want to give folks the benefit of the doubt at the, at the beginning, right? They clearly don't know about the issues if they haven't taken issue, or if they haven't taken action on it. And we want to do what we can to um, work with them as, as productively as, as possible. And for most companies, we do work with them. It is, you know, behind the scenes interactions that get out, or that end up with a public commitment. Um, on occasion, though, we do need to give companies the courtesy of letting them know that we are going to campaign against them, um, and that uh, in a lot of cases that does result in a corporate commitment. It's kind of like the counting to three that I do for my three-year-old, the corporate edition. <laughs> um, there's a bunch of questions on the portion of the talk where you mentioned just accountability, follow-through, um, obviously a major concern. So maybe just in general, because this, this spans probably three or four different questions, how do you really make sure that, that companies do follow through? Auditing, legal, you know, returning to undercover investigations, like there's a bunch of different um, questions here that touch on that. But yeah, tell us more about how you actually make sure it happens. Yeah, so we really rely on the reporting of companies and Mercy for Animals, we're not an auditing group. Um, we do not endorse suppliers or anything like that. Um, so we really do re rely on that reporting that companies do. And a lot of them are motivated to tell the truth because they have their own internal auditing of those um, projects. I unfortunately can't speak to undercover investigation work. That's really confidential. But um, yeah, for now, we rely on companies and, and their reporting and the honesty in their reporting because they have their own uh, internal auditors as well as if they were to lie to their shareholders about the progress that they were making on ESG issues, that would be very, very problematic. So you think overall they can be trusted? I think right now, overall, I wouldn't say every company can be trusted, but I think 
a lot of them um, can be trusted. Yeah, obviously you've got kind of layers as well because there's multiple tiers in the supply chain, which one can be lying to another as well. So that is a tricky issue. But I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised to hear you say that overall you think there's, that that's a higher level of trust than I would have expected you to have in, uh, in corporations. I guess I'll clarify. The corporations I'm working with are um, typically global multinational corporations that have a ton of oversight, a ton of internal auditing, um, that do have stakeholders, that do have, you know, report in accordance with SASB or uh, other major ESG standards. So I think with, yeah, with the other standards in place right now, I, I would trust what those companies are saying. Yeah, well, that's good news. I mean, yeah. those companies obviously constitute a major portion of the market. Um, interesting question on kind of what's next. So if, if this is the lowest hanging fruit, banning battery cages seems like the lowest hanging fruit for animal welfare. If that were to happen, what do you think is kind of the, the next item up on the priority list or maybe the, you know, the next few? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would say that the next step is something that has happened in the United States. So back in about 2016 in the United States, the US animal protection movement launched a campaign to improve the lives of chickens that are raised for meat. Um, and one of the reasons why is because when we look at the population of hens on earth, for example, laying hens, there's about 4.8 billion of them. But when we look at chickens that are raised for meat, there's about 70 billion of them. So the stakes are much higher in terms of the number of animals that we can impact. Um, but it's a much more complicated ask. Uh, it has been a much more complicated ask. There's gonna be much more complicated accountability aspects of it. And it is an area where there's been a lot of traction in the past and we need to continue holding companies accountable. So I think in parts of the world where we're still working on this, this cage-free work and this cage-free accountability, um, broiler chicken welfare might be the next step, but in you know, certain parts of the world, fish is a really important protein and um, there might be more opportunities for us to focus on fish welfare in, in those areas. So 70 billion versus 4.8? Yeah, so like pretty significant. Yeah, and when you look difference. at fish, we're we're getting into the trillions. So the the there's a lot of different um, scales of the animals. So what makes the broiler side so much more complicated and difficult to make progress on? And there's a, a question too related to that, which is what do you think caused the decline in progress on broiler chickens in the 2019 2020 timeframe? Yeah. So let me answer the first part about. Um, Sorry, the first part of the question was... Yeah, what makes it so much harder? What makes it harder? Yeah, so with, with um, chickens that are raised for meat, and the, the term used in the industry is, is broiler chicken, so those are synonymous. Um, they typically in the United States are not in cages, and so with, with the work of getting rid of cages for laying hens, it's a very easy thing to explain to the public. Like you, We want to move away from cages towards cage-free eggs. Um, that is something that's just well understood. Uh, however, for ch chickens that are raised for meat, the, the areas that they suffer are so much more complicated. The ask that we have developed, it took several years to actually put a brand name to it, uh, which is now the Better Chicken Commitment, but prior to that, it was the Joint Animal Protection Organization like ask on broiler chicken welfare. It was very complicated. And it involves everything from changing the breed of the bird. The birds have been bred to grow very, very fast, um, despite the fact that their internal organs aren't able to keep up with the, with the growth of the um, parts of the body that are end up used for meat. Uh, the animal welfare, sorry, the on-farm welfare conditions of the animals, so everything, sorry, from the lighting to the uh, litter to the stocking density in the barns, um, and then also at the end of their lives. In the United States, animals, sorry, in the, in the United States, chickens are not protected under the Humane Slaughter Act, and as a result of that, they are not required to even be stunned before they are slaughtered. And so one of the most common practices in the US for, for killing chickens that are raised for meat is what they call live shackle slaughter, where they are hung upside down, fully conscious, they are, they're, they're brought through um, an electric water stunning bath, and many of them are not actually fully stunned, and then after that, they have their, their throats cut. Um, and it's, it's an extremely traumatic process. I mean, I think a lot of slaughter is, is very, very traumatic, uh, but that is very traumatic. And so also including ways to improve the um, 
or I don't, I don't want to say improve, to make less worse the, the conditions of slaughter. So the ask is more complicated, um, and it's very hard to, to brand that for the public, right? How do you brand breed and slaughter and all the different on-farm conditions from enrichments to lighting to uh, litter? And so I think that was one of the things that made it particularly complicated in the US. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, looking back at this, I, it's obviously not much change at the top, way more change in the next three uh, categories. But it seems like your comment on changing the conditions of slaughter in the broiler case is much more focused on the top, right? It's like it's the shortest duration, but most you know awful experience. How do you think about that in general? Like I, I sometimes I think that obviously the, that's that scene is so vivid, but many people have bad ends to their lives. And I often think like, you know, that's definitely very bad, but it doesn't make sort of the life not worth having been lived. You know, it doesn't kind of negate everything. Um, so how do you think about that sort of final moment versus the ongoing? I mean, this, this would seem to suggest that like more of the juice is in the, you know, zero through T minus five minutes before slaughter. Yeah, so there is a huge amount of suffering that happens in the lives of chickens that are raised for meat. And so one of the areas is literally just how their bodies have been bred over the last uh, you know, 70 years or so. There's been work to increase the growth rate of chickens. I think they grow like, I'm forgetting the exact number, but I want to say six times faster uh, than they did in around the 1940s, 1950s. And that growth is not proportionate to their entire bodies. It, they are... Um, really trying to grow, like for example, the breast meat of the birds really, really fast. Um, and as a result of that, their bones aren't able to keep up, their internal organs aren't able to keep up. Um, and so just literally the, the, the basic DNA of the birds is something that needs to change. And um, there's a lot of research being done into how to improve that. And then of course also the on-farm conditions. So giving animals the enrichments that they need so that they're not, once they're able to actually move around, uh, they're not just like bored out of their minds and just you know psychologically tormented, and also that they have the litter that they need to you know exhibit their their natural behaviors. So yeah, I would agree that there's a lot that needs to happen throughout their lives, and those are actually components that are part of the better chicken commitment. But again, it's just it's such a complicated um, topic, and there there has been a lot of progress on it in the U.S. Um, but it's something that we just need to be very mindful of as we uh, continue working on that in other regions around the world. We've got uh, seven or eight minutes, so we do have okay. some time for additional questions. I think I've covered almost all of the ones that have come in. I know you're not um, positioning yourself as the leading expert on the alternative protein movement, but there is a question on kind of the future of, you know, what, what do you think things will look like over time? Like, do you expect that ultimately alternative proteins win out and that just kind of becomes the norm and that happens through like a market mechanism of just prices, you know, as, uh, as Bruce talks about, it's, you know, taste, price and convenience. Is, is that ultimately the way that you think industrial agriculture goes away or is there still something more cultural that you feel needs, will be likely to need to happen even if those, um, you know, kind of price, uh, cost and convenience, or price, taste and convenience uh, yeah. factors are are in favor of alternative yeah. proteins? Well, I'm not an expert in this space, so um, I don't know, Bruce, if, if you would be willing to uh, answer this question a little bit. No, you know, okay, nope, you don't need to if you don't, if you're, if you don't want to. <laughs> okay, here, we're gonna have a microphone run over to you. <laughs> Sorry, would you mind repeating the question, Nathan? Yeah, basically, do you think that there is additional cultural work or change that needs to happen beyond the factors of price, taste, and convenience ultimately kind of winning out in a market dynamic. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a premise to the question that I also just want to um, address super quickly, and that is it's really, like, we don't know for sure. So the GFI theme is the products need to taste the same or better and cost the same or less, and that is necessary. And further to the question, maybe not sufficient. Um, so there may be barriers beyond price and taste. We think markets are very likely 
to solve those things. But even if not, we need to double down on them. Uh, but I'll also just say we are years away from cost competitive plant-based meat that satisfies, tastes the same or better, and costs the same or less, um, and even further away on cultivated meat, um, which is why the work of, of MFA and THL and, and others to alleviate just the unimaginable, unmitigated suffering that Zoe so eloquently described um, is so critically important. So on the one hand, yes, very, very optimistic about this over time. On the other hand, we don't know for sure. Um, it hasn't been done yet. Um, and it's not going to be easy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so a question about kind of preparation or background for the kind of work that you do. What sorts of potentially educational or kind of career experience would somebody need to have to take on a role like yours and be successful? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think in the type of role that I have, um, interpersonal communication is very important as well as negotiating with companies and just the ability to communicate in a very professional and, and clear manner um, and also be willing to um, be okay with high pressure situations. I think that's something that's really important in corporate engagement work uh, in the animal welfare space. In terms of preparation for that, I think there's a People can come from a, many different backgrounds to get here, anything from business school. I personally got my um, bachelor's in biology as well as environmental studies, and I later got my master's in food and agriculture law and policy, and I think those all can really play into this kind of work, but there's a lot of different ways that, that folks can come in. I would say the, the probably the most important skill sets in this area are the interpersonal skills, the ability to communicate very professionally in very high pressure situations, including being able to negotiate, uh, and, and frankly, having a passion. I think that it's difficult to do this kind of work if you are not passionate about doing the most good you can for farmed animals. Um, and so that, I think that's a really important underlying factor. An interesting question uh, just came in, a, a pretty philosophical one, I think. What is your view about animals that potentially do not come into existence at all as the, you know, as the change unfolds. Um, I'll just leave it at that. What do you think about animals that never come to exist in the first place? The current treatment of farmed animals, uh, or, or the fact that farmed animals are considered commodities, is extremely upsetting and horrendous. Um, the fact that these sentient animals are you know, at the whims of how corporations decide to operate is, is very tragic. And so I think that if the trade-off, which the trade-off is, like either they are bred into existence to, you know, live in these factory farms or they're not bred into existence at all, um, I think that's by far the better alternative. Uh, the lives that these animals are suffering through on factory farms, I do not think are worth living. Um, when we saw, you know, 11,000 hours of pain for a hen in a battery cage, that is close to, like, a, I'm trying to do quick calculations in my head, close to like a year and a half or, or more um, of pain, and that's yeah. about how long about they live. About 400 days, I think I, I did the. You did the math, okay, <laughs> yeah. So about 400 days worth of pain, and, and they live usually That's 24 between, hour days too. So 24 hour days, right, yeah. For their... So that's, uh, and they live for about a year and a half to two years, depending on whether they do what's called forced molting, which is um, when they, starve the hens, it's, it's a horrible practice. I won't get into detail, but yeah, I don't think that their lives are worth living on factory farms. Okay, uh, maybe one or two more questions. What about um, the role of direct democracy and you know, kind of citizens initiatives in this space? We had chatted a bit about Proposition 12, uh, which passed with, I believe it was like 62% of the vote in California, that would mm -hmm. certainly seem to suggest that there could be a lot more progress through direct democracy. Is that something that you guys think about or have any plans to work on? Um, yeah, that's me. a great question. So I think policy is, it, like public policy is so important in this space. And yeah, there were citizens initiatives like Prop 12 in California, as well as the bill in Massachusetts that passed a few years before um, Prop 12 back in 2018. And these bills are great because I think they cement the progress that corporations are making, but also these corporate commitments go in and say, hey, like we're not gonna oppose these bills because we're already committed to doing this. Um, and when those legislative, you know, 
when those legislative uh, laws come into place, whether they're through citizens' initiatives or just through normal legislative routes, um, it really like c cements that progress. And so I think there's great opportunity for more um, policy. Well, I, I guess I want to. Policy work in this space is difficult, but I think when we're able to make progress on it, it is worth it. Um, and I know specifically for the confinement of hens, there's already been a lot of progress in 10 states that have put out bans. So um, yeah, I'm excited about the work in this area. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Those are all of the questions that we have. So how about thank another you, round of applause for Zoe Sigler. Thanks. Thanks very much. Appreciate Great job. It.